Hi everybody, uh, we are today going to be working with our electric pressure cookers or instant pots or any multi-cooker. Uh, there's several on the market. Mine happens to be an instant pot. And I was very skeptical about spending this amount of money on an appliance that I wasn't sure if I was really going to use. Um, but I borrowed one from my friend Christy and I was like, holy crap, this thing's amazing. So we're going to be working with that today. I'm going to give you some tips. I'm going to give you some tricks and I'm going to teach you how to make something that everybody needs to know how to make. Um, everybody should know how to make chicken stock. You shouldn't have to buy it all the time. If you're ever getting a rotisserie chicken from the grocery store, Oh, you're gonna have to mute that then. Okay, well, I'm finding it. I'm finding it. Lynn is my uh, lovely camera person today. And uh, for those of you joining us the first time, this is a real house. This is my real kitchen. And those are real dogs. And they may or may not bark at any given time because my Boston Terrier thinks that she owns the entire street. And if a shadow goes by or a leaf blows, she barks. So. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes, but I wanna talk about this Instant Pot for a few minutes. Um, I grew up in an age, cause I am and years old, and um, my mom told me horror stories about pressure cookers exploding. We have all seen the pictures and the videos online. Just Google pressure cooker explosion and you will see all the videos. Things stuck into people's ceilings, stoves trashed. Your Instant Pot is not like that. Now, I had a stovetop pressure cooker and it made me very, very nervous to use. And I gave it away because it made me look up. So what I'm gonna tell you about this is once it is sealed and your pressure comes in, it is impossible for you to screw it up, okay? Now, each one, is a little bit different. I'm gonna kind of turn mine around. Uh, I don't know, Lynn, can you see my Instant Pot from here? Or do I need to move it a little closer? No, I, I can see Okay, it. so each of the interfaces is going to be slightly different based on the model that you have. Mine has this stupid turny button that goes through the different options here on the sides. I'm not really a fan of that. So I hope you know how yours works. Um, if not, you can certainly pause this video at any time just by touching it, or you can watch the whole thing, figure out the controls on your Instant Pot, and then come back and watch the video. And I actually have done that. I started to talk about this in the last demo that I did. Uh, I have been really loving, loving, loving the secretburger.com one night only cook-alongs with some of the local chefs here in Las Vegas. And James Trees, up. Uh, James Beard Award nominee, James Trees, from Esther's Kitchen, did my absolute favorite dish that he makes, which is his cacio e pepe, and he did it as a live demo. So I was able to watch it, take copious notes, go back and cook live with him later with the ingredients. So my cacio e pepe is delicious now. I figured out everything that I was doing wrong. And now mine, it's not quite as good as James's. I still prefer to have somebody else make it for me, but it's pretty damn tasty. So that's what you can do with this. Pause it by touching the screen and you won't be cooking live with me at that point, but you'll still be cooking. And, or you can just watch the whole video and then replay it for yourself at a later time. Okay, so on the back of, your, of some models of Instant Pots, you'll see right here there's a catch. And this is to catch any extra steam that develops inside that would create a problem with the pressure. So you just check that thing after usage and clean it out so it doesn't get gross. Uh, inside every Instant Pot there is a stainless tub. Mine happens to be a six quart model. So if you are using a six quart model, the recipe that we're gonna do today is gonna yield you roughly three quarts. Did I say six cup? It's six quart. <laughs> it's a six quart model. So the um, recipe is going to yield you roughly three quarts of chicken stock. Now, I normally make chicken stock in a great big vat. Uh, it's a 20 quart stock pot and I end up yielding roughly 12 quarts and then I have a pressure canner, which is another whole conversation, 
and I can my chicken stock and use it. But if I have a rotisserie chicken for whatever reason, I don't wanna waste those bones. So I'm gonna make a quick batch that's gonna be much smaller and then I'll give, I'll give Lynn a quart of chicken stock today for her to take home. I give some to my son, I put one in the freezer, or I'll put them all in the freezer until I have enough to can, and then I'll can it. So um, one of the things you need to check is inside your Instant Pot lid, there is a silicone uh, gasket. And you wanna make sure that it is properly seated. Now I had spoken to on another video uh, when asking what you guys wanted to learn. Several people said that they were afraid of their instant pot. Uh, one person said that she tried to make double or she tried to make hard boiled eggs and the water all boiled out. And I bet that it's because the seal, the gasket was not seated in the seal properly. You want to make sure, and I hope you can see this that it is gripped by that wire ring all the way around. Because if it's not, your pot will never seal, you will never get it up to pressure, and it's just gonna be like a boiling situation, okay? So I'm gonna set my lid off to the side. We're gonna get to work creating our mirepoix. So mirepoix, sorry about this, you guys, my hair is a little out of control. Um, mirepoix is three things. Now, if you've ever cooked Cajun or Creole, you know about the Trinity. The Trinity is onion, bell pepper, and celery, according to Justin Wilson, the Cajun cook. But mirepoix is the French basic seasoning. So it's twice as much onion. It's two parts onion, one part celery, one part carrot. Now, I told you to have one large onion or two small ones medium carrot, and two ribs of celery. Now, the thing about working with celery, I'm gonna show you a couple of things. I'm just gonna cut the rest of this up and this is gonna be fine. If you have celery leaves on your stems, you, you know, you didn't bite the core or the heart of the celery and you've got leaves, throw the leaves in there because the leaves have so much flavor and they're gonna really add a perfect herbally celery flavor to your stock. So let's start with our onion. I mean, you know what? I'm going to end with the onions because the onions always make me cry and I'm going to start with the celery instead. <clears throat> so you can cut this as fine as you want. And the finer you cut it, the more water is going to touch your vegetables and actually, you know, really eke out all the flavor. I'm going to do this in about half inch slices. You could do it in one inch slices. You can get crazy and chop the hell out of it, whatever you want. Okay, I'm doing it in about half inch slices. You'll notice my fingers are pushed back. And if you get the heart in there, that's great. It's gonna add a ton of celery flavor. So that's roughly two ribs worth. And we're gonna pop it right on in. And this is gonna go in my compost bin. And then we're gonna do our carrot. Now, this carrot's mega, it's massive. And it is from Desert Bloom Eco Farm which is a co-op that you can buy into, and they have um, scheduled um, buy-ins, scheduled shares that you can purchase. And uh, we are lucky enough to have been on the buying end when they offered this spring offering, and this is one of those tremendous carrots from them. If you have been following along, um, oh, I'm lying. This is not from... Eco Bloom, but you should do that anyway. Um, Desert Bloom Eco Farm, if you saw on Instagram or on Facebook the beautiful carrot dish, those carrots are from Desert Bloom. This one happens to be from a company called Imperfect Foods that uh, allows you to purchase food that is either overstock or too large or too small or too weird shaped for them to sell in a grocery store. We're gonna do the same thing with this, half inch to one inch slices. Now I'm going fast now because I know that some of you are just watching to work later. And also because I have to bone out my chicken because I'm assuming you guys have already done that because I gave you the instructions to do that in the uh, ingredient list. So, uh, Lynn, how many people we got watching? Five. Great. Any questions so far? None so far. 
My sister Nancy may or may not be watching because she said that she was working today with some relaxed restrictions. She had to get some work done and she was going to end up having to watch this later. She's not so far. Uh, one of the things you need to know is that we are not going to be doing a demo this Saturday. We are taking the Saturday off. We're going to be doing a demo next Saturday. And we're going to be doing the shrimp scampi and rice pilaf. So we're going to teach you a great technique to make a perfectly fluffy rice pilaf that you are going to be so excited about. Okay, now we're going to work with our onion. Now remember, your onion has the stem end and the root end. Always cut the stem end off to create a flat space. Put it tail end up. Cut top to bottom, or bottom to top in this case, and peel off these parts. Now you might wonder why I save those other things for my uh, compost heap, and I'm not saving these. Years ago, one of my good friends, Doreen, told me, and she had been composting for years, that she was told not to put onion or onion family, alien family items, into the composter. So I don't. Yes. Uh, Debbie has a question. Is there a difference between stock and broth? You know, that's a really great question. Typically, stock is richer. It has a higher collagen content. So it is more, um, has a better mouthfeel. It's more velvety. But in many recipes, they are completely interchangeable. We are, we are aiming for a stock today because we're actually gonna use the bones and hopefully cook out the collagen from our bones to uh, create a really rich, delicious, uh, silky almost uh, stock. Broth is generally thinner and you can use both for soups, you can use both for sauces. Um, in most cases, they are completely interchangeable. Every now and then you'll find a recipe that will specify stock, not broth, but it's so few and far between. It's really not worth mentioning or worrying about. And Nancy Mason said, tell her three from San Antonio are watching. Hey! Hi, Nancy Mason. Nancy Mason and Debbie and I, and I, I'm going to guess the third person from San Antonio is uh, my friend Annette. Um, we all bowl together. We, yes, we're a bowling babe. Now again, with your uh, knife cuts, you can make them as thin as you want, or you can make them as coarse as you want. You just don't want to throw the whole thing in, you know, as a whole piece. I am just going top to bottom, like four times across the top of the onion, and going crosswise. Oh, man. Again, the onions always make me cry, you guys. So mirepoix can be adjusted for recipes. Um, sometimes, you know, if you don't have enough uh, onion and you have plenty of celery and carrot, go ahead and go for it, it's fine. But for traditional French cooking, it's two parts onion, one part carrot, one part celery. And you guess the correct three. I guess the correct three. Okay, cool. Now, Nat, when she first met me, couldn't stand me. And you know why that was? Because we were too much alike. <laughs> and now, we're bosom buds. The first time Nanette actually saw me cook, she's like, oh my God. <laughs> she didn't realize that I actually knew what I was doing. Okay. So now we're going to put the remainder of our aromatics. So mirepoix is called aromatics because it not only adds flavor to it, but it adds aroma. Okay, so guys, I'm sorry, I gotta wash my hands because of the onion. Holy cow. If um, onion makes you cry, running your hands under cold water and just quickly, briskly rubbing them back and forth will really help. And if you get onion flavor on your hands, if you have a stainless steel sink, you just get them wet and run around the inside of the sink and it'll help get rid of that smell. Okay, so we're gonna put in a good size bay leaf. This bay leaf mm, happens to be from Egypt from when I went last year. Now, one of the things you need to know about herbs and spices is this. Everything that I'm gonna start with is a spice. Um, except bay leaf. 
Bay leaf could go either way. So spices are generally roots, seeds, nuts, hard things that need to be ground or pulverized in some fashion in order to be palatable. Herbs are generally the leafy part of a plant. So if you look at cilantro, the beautiful green part that you love in all your Mexican and Asian food, that is cilantro. But if you let it go to seed, those seeds are called coriander and coriander is a spice. Now that's all of course in American English. Um, in Indian cooking, they will specify leafy coriander or seed coriander because they call them both coriander. But in English, American English, the seeds are called coriander and that is a spice. The leafy part is called uh, cilantro and it's an herb. Okay, so now we're gonna add our black peppercorns. Now, I happen to like a lot of peppercorn in mine and so I'm gonna put in roughly a teaspoon of whole black peppercorns. We are not going to be grinding it, okay? We're gonna add a whole clove or two or three, depending on how much you like that flavor. And remember, this is gonna cook at pressure. Oh God, I love that smell. So I'm gonna put two of them in because these ones are kind of big. Now whole spices. What are those? Cloves. Oh, cloves. Okay. Whole spices last longer in your pantry because when you grind a spice, you release the oils and the oils are the part that go rancid. So you could keep whole spices almost indefinitely as long as they're properly stored at a proper temperature. If they get too hot, forget about it, you know. But once they're ground, you need to use them like pretty much within 90 days. So I try to keep as many whole spices around as possible. So we've got our bay leaf in there, which could be either a spice or an herb, depending on how you look at it. We've got black peppercorn, a couple of cloves, and now we're gonna put in herbs to Provence. So if you've ever cooked Italian food and you've used Italian seasoning, Herbs to Provence is to French cooking what Italian seasoning is to Italian cooking. And this is a blend of thyme and lavender and depending on where it's from, maybe some marjoram or some savory. It's a blend of herbs. And you can use straight up thyme if that's what you've got and go for it. I love that, that's how I was taught. But I love the Herbs to Provence component. I love the way it smells when it cooks, so that's what I use. And I'm pretty friggin' liberal with this. So even for just a two quart or a six quart volume, I'm gonna put in roughly three good sized tablespoons of Herbs de Provence. Let me get a little sip because my mouth's getting dry. Okay, now we're gonna add in some parsley stems. There is no point in wasting the beautiful leafy part of your parsley in a stock, okay? So you should be storing these just like I showed you how to store them in a previous episode where you rinse them and wrap them in paper towels and keep them from, to keep them from drying out and help them maintain their freshness. I told you to have five or six, that's about three that were cut up. And I'm just gonna whack the ends off of these and put these in as well. This is gonna give you that great parsley flavor without wasting the beautiful leafy part that you can use for other things, okay? And I just dropped my paper towels into the trash by accident, so I'm just gonna move these over here. And then we're gonna add in the final aromatic. And I didn't put this on the list because this is not traditional, but you can add it to yours if you want, like I do mine. I love a couple of cloves of garlic in my chicken stock, okay? And all you're gonna do is put them on the board, use the flat side of your knife, mash it, get the skin off, and pop it in there. You don't have to cut it up. You don't have to chop it, mince it, dice it, nothing, just throw it in. Now see, this one's got a little imperfection. I don't know if you can see that. We're just gonna cut it off and pitch it, it's fine. The rest of the clove looks great, and so in it goes. This is a great way to use up carrots that might have gone a little bit limp. You can refresh them in some ice water. Celery that might have gotten a little limp and refresh it in some ice water before you throw it in. Because you don't want to put that in a chicken salad or a tuna salad or something like that. But this is a great way to use that up and not waste that produce. You know, we're in quarantine, so we don't want to waste anything. All right, we've got our chicken here. Remember I showed you how it was trussed. 
which means that the legs and the wings were tied together and it goes back across the back. Now, I want you to make sure that all of this beautiful gelatinous came onto it because we're gonna pop that in the pot too just to give it a little extra flavor. And it, because it is already kind of gelatinous, and I hate that word, and for the record, the word congealed is my least favorite word of all time. Um, Debbie's least favorite word is moist, and it is also, or it's succulent rather. Nancy's least favorite word is moist. And <laughs> those neither of those words bother me. Congealed bothers me, and this is congealed. But we want this, because we want it to go into our stock. All right, so <clears throat> I hope you have already taken your meat off your chicken, but I didn't. So I'm just gonna show you one more time how I do it. Take our big old knife, and we run it right down the breastbone and cut straight on through. And then we pop it back open. We're gonna actually rip our wings off and throw those in because the wings have a lot of cartilage, they have a lot of collagen, and we want that in our stock, okay? I'm gonna do the same thing with my legs. I'm just gonna pull them off. Again, they have a lot of collagen, they have a lot of cartilage, and it's gonna make our stock very silk, silky tasting and smooth, and it's gonna give it a great mouthfeel. Now we're gonna pull off all this meat and all this skin, and we're gonna throw the bones right into that stock pot. So, ask away on your questions while I'm doing this because it's gonna take me a couple of minutes. I also kind of built in this time so that if you were cooking with me, um, that you had plenty of time to do your knife skills on your celery and your carrots and your onions. Okay, if you've got spine, throw it in. Tons of cartilage, tons of collagen, and we want that in there because it's gonna really increase the mouthfeel. The fat you're gonna be able to skim off later, don't worry if you have fat in there, it's gonna be fine. Now, I'm just throwing all my meat right into this bowl because I'm gonna use it for another purpose. I'm actually gonna make an Asian um, cabbage salad with, believe it or not, ramen noodles. I know everybody's had it it's like that, but um, I like to keep it in the summertime because it's a quick, easy lunch for me and you can make a huge batch of it all at once. Make sure you get that breastbone out of there and into the pot. Because the breastbone is predominantly cartilage. And as I have said already several times, cartilage is going to really help our stock have a great mouthfeel. So you'll notice sometimes if you've made chicken stock before, you've made chicken broth before, sometimes when you put your chicken stock in the refrigerator overnight, you get it out and it's like kind of jiggly like jello. That means you did a really good job of extracting all the good parts out of the bones. So it doesn't always happen. Sometimes you have too much liquid in there. Sometimes the chicken just didn't have a whole lot to offer. It happens. But if you can get in on the bone, the bone is where all that really good stuff is. So don't worry about breaking the spine and putting it in there. You're gonna strain everything out later. So all of this stuff is all gonna get strained out. And I'm just using my hands. You know, I don't need a knife for this, really. Because you're just going to pull all that meat off the bone. You're going to save it for another use and throw the bones right into the pot. Now, each of these models has a line on the inside. And I don't care who your manufacturer is, whether it's Instant Pot or somebody else. It has a line on the inside that tells you max volume. Really important that you do not, when we add our water, fill beyond that because the pressure that is gonna be created by the, that amount of liquid is gonna be the max that this pot can stand. Got our chicken. And you'll see I've got these great bones. I'm adding it right into the pot. The ribs are great, again, with that breast bone. Make sure you get that whole breastbone in there because it is nothing but cartilage, really. And it's gonna cook down. 
So when you cook at pressure, what it's allowing you to do is cook at a much higher temperature. I don't know if you remember your chemistry and your physics, but liquids under pressure come to a boil faster than liquids not at pressure. So we're gonna, I don't know what the actual um, PSI is on this, but it's going to be fairly high, uh, pounds per square inch, and it allows the water to come to a, a rolling boil a lot quicker, and it's going to help the heat that's um, generated is going to allow you to extract more flavor out of what you're putting into the pot, okay? Like I said, I'm adding all of the leftover juices from the maple dance into the pot because those are all seasoned already, okay? I'm going to use the back of my knife to scrape up this board. Let me go get the scraper. My bench scraper is not like a chef's bench scraper. It's, it's cute because it's red. Okay. I'm going to rinse my hands really quickly so I'm not spreading chicken grease around. All right, so now you're going to add cold water to your pot, okay? Cold water. And you're going to fill it to where it says maximum fill line. That's how much water you want in there. So with all of your aromatics and with all of your chicken in there, you're roughly going to be adding about three quarts of liquid, and that's what you're going to get out of it because that chicken is going to start to sweat and break down, and all the moisture that's in there is going to end up in your stock. Okay, so put your lid on and seal it however your unit seals. They're all a little bit different. Mine is a push down turn. You want to find your pressure cook option. You want to set it to high pressure. This one you have to push on the button for each thing. And you want to set it for one hour. Okay, once you have it set on high for one hour, hit your start button or whatever the indicator is to get the machine going. What it's going to do is it's going to bring the liquid up to temperature. It's going to create, the steam is going to create pressure. And on my model, and I'll move it while it's still, right here, there's a little button that pops up. When that button pops up, you are under pressure. You are not going to be able to release this liquid, okay? So, you're going to cook it at pressure for one hour. Then you're going to leave it the hell alone. It'll beep to tell you when it's done. Leave it alone and let the pressure release naturally, which is going to take you seriously about another hour. And your button, your pressure release button will sink back in. You're going to take your lid off. And then remember I told you to have a colander and a large bowl ready? You're going to strain your stock through that colander or sieve. I like to use, I'll show you what I use. I like to use, this is, remember that thing I kept saying I was forgetting something? Yep. This is what I forgot. <laughs> I like to use a fine mesh sieve like this. And because I'm particular about my chicken stock and I like it to be really clear, I actually take a brewer's bag and I put the sieve inside the brewer's bag so that it strains it here, strains it with the strainer, and then strains it on the way out. If you've got cheesecloth, you can line your sieve or your uh, colander with the um, cheesecloth and that'll help you do the same thing. Once, and I like to wait for it to cool so I can actually handle the pot with my bare hands. Uh, you can do it however you want, but I like to strain it before I put it in the refrigerator and then everything that's in here, it goes in the garbage because you have sucked out every good thing from what's in there. You have sucked the marrow out of the life of that chicken thigh, that 
chicken leg, there was chicken wings. You know, you've really done everything you can with them, just throw them out, okay? Um, I would not, if you have a, a compost heap, put those into the composter for two reasons. One, it has onion in it, and onion is supposed to be bad for a composter, but I don't know why. Two, it has meat in it, and meat draws predators. And since I'm really not supposed to have a composter at all, because I live in an HOA, I don't put anything that can draw predators. I only put vegetable scraps in mine. Bobby, uh, one of my friends from high school said, I thought you were a composter. I am, but I don't put any um, meat product into it, and I don't put any alien product into it. So you are, I'm done with you for the day. Because there is, I'm not going to sit here with you for two hours while you're, because your unit's going to take at least 15 minutes to come to pressure. And then it's going to cook for an hour. Then you're going to let that steam release naturally for another hour before you strain it. Now, hopefully, if your chicken was a good chicken and you added the drippings from your pan, which were already, you could see they were already like chicken jello, and you've done everything right. When you chill your stock, it's gonna have like a, I'm not saying it's gonna be like jello, like aspic, but it's not gonna be perfectly fluid. And so you're gonna have this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stock to work with. So here's a couple of things that you can do it once you've got it. One, make yourself an amazing Do some chicken and dumplings. Freeze it in small portions to be used for other recipes like the chicken piccata, which you can find on YouTube. Uh, you can use it for any recipe that calls for chicken stock or chicken broth. And you've just saved yourself a shit ton of money because buying chicken stock in a quart container, I mean, if you're getting a quality brand that doesn't have salt, oh, guess what I didn't put in there? Salt. You know why? Because that rotisserie chicken's already salted, first of all. Second, you're going to add salt when you cook with the stock. You don't want to add salt now. Cook with it later. This is one of the few things where I don't add salt. <laughs> so mark it down on your calendars. We can't cook without salt today. Um, so any recipe that you're doing that, and there's canola having a field day. Uh, any recipe that you're doing. Hey, Lynn, my spray bottle. My, I have a spray bottle, and Lynn's going to discipline them right now. Um, any recipe that you're doing that calls for chicken stock or chicken broth, you're going to be able to use this. And the best part of it all is that you can say, oh, yes, I made it myself. I didn't have to buy chicken stock. Now, I have what my sister Nancy calls Chinese Tupperware because this is what the Chinese wonton soup comes in when I order it in the restaurant. I, I will freeze it in these, you know, of course, pull it on it. Label it, date it, so you know how long it's been in the freezer in case it gets shoved to the back. Even if you're using this to store in the refrigerator, label it and date it so you know how long it's been in there. This will keep three or four days in the refrigerator and then about three months in the freezer, maybe four, depending on how good your freezer is. But you can freeze it in this. Um, if you have a pressure canner and know how to use it, you can pressure can your chicken stock, which is what I do. And you're going to be able to use this for anything. You, you can use it for the rice pilaf that we're going to make. You can use it for any number of dishes. And it's super easy. And it's totally hands-off once you get the prep done. So I hope that this has been helpful to you. I hope that you do this. Are there questions, Lynn, that I haven't answered? No. Nope. Wow. No. That means I've done a really good job of explaining shit today. Woohoo! Yay me. Um, I'm going to wait a couple seconds because I know we have a 10-second delay so that it will give you guys the opportunity to ask me some questions. In the meantime, I'm gonna put my spices away in my fancy schmancy spice cabinet that I love. I don't know if this shows up in the yeah, video or not. It does. It does? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my spice cabinet's pretty friggin' epic. And it took me a long time to get it that way. I pulled this out because I thought I was gonna have to mash it down, but I didn't have to. No questions? No. Awesome. That means I did a really good job explaining things. So what I hope that you do is if you have not subscribed to my blog, and I haven't written anything in a while, I promise you that I'll get around to it. Subscribe to my blog at goodforspooning.com. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at goodforspooning. 
This video will show up on Good for Spooning, both on Facebook and on YouTube for you to follow later. And I am going to be reposting it so that people who missed it, they feel like, oh shit, I forgot, that they can chime on in and they can get involved with making their own chicken stock and end up looking like a freaking superhero. So I hope you have enjoyed your afternoon with me. We have spent, uh, how much time today? Uh, about 30. 36 minutes. I told you it was going to be 20. So there you go. Love you all. I can't wait to see pictures of your stock. I can't wait to see pictures of what you make with your stock. So by all means, post them and tag me and all of them. And have a fantastic afternoon.